Welcome to uh, Intersections, and let me knock over my microphone uh, in my excitement to be here. Uh, I'm John Kao, uh, half of the hosting uh, team at Intersections. Uh, my co-host, Brian, uh, is elsewhere today, and so I'm flying solo, which is not inappropriate given that I've had a long-lived relationship with our esteemed guest, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But let me welcome you all to Intersections, a weekly conversational jam session which melds culture, technology, innovation, and much more into a cohesive experience for all of you every week, 1030, Thursday, um, in the interest of discovery and also of unlearning. Because you know, here we are in the post-pandemic era where we uh, all need, in a sense, to adopt beginner's mind uh, what the Zen Buddhists uh, term the, the state of being that enables new creative ideas to happen. It's very interesting. You know, the Zen Buddhists say, uh, there's a saying that in the mind of the expert, there are many opinions. And in the mind of the beginner, there are no opinions. And therefore, all new things begin with beginner's mind. And that's probably a really interesting uh, topic to keep in mind as uh, we delve into the artistry of our uh, guest, Taylor Igesty. Again, I'll introduce him in just a moment, but jazz requires both the expertise of someone who's worked for years, if not decades, to perfect their knowledge of the theory and the traditions and the, uh, the mechanics of playing the instrument, but on the other hand, uh, has been able to delve into beginner's mind to create something that is fresh and of the moment. So. Jazz is, in a way, a powerful uh, a way of illustrating some of the creative tensions that I think we all encounter when we uh, try to innovate, try to create from a, a business or a social perspective. Um, I won't really belabor backgrounds. Uh, uh, those of you that have uh, seen the show before know that uh, my co-host, Brian Solis, is the global evangelist for innovation at Salesforce and a noted figure in the digital uh, arena with uh, multiple credits to his name in terms of best-selling books and thought leadership of all kinds, linking digital to innovation, digital to marketing, digital to social. And I've been a, a innovation activist, I guess you could say, for about 35 years, uh, taught at Harvard Business School, taught at other interesting places, uh, started companies, uh, have been a CEO. So actually, I suppose I know something about the practicalities of innovation. But I've also delved into uh, uh, a number of different uh, sectors to kind of refine my knowledge of how innovation works, whether it be film, music, uh, Broadway theater, Silicon Valley high tech startups. And now, uh, crazy as that might seem, uh, in pre startup mode on an AI fueled um, uh, venture to uh, hopefully revol revolutionize the whole area of upskilling and reskilling. So welcome, we're so excited to have you with us. Um, today is gonna be a rather unusual and I think um, a special uh, format, not just because of the solo, uh, the solo uh, hosting function, but because we're actually gonna focus on one guest. Um, as you may recall, if you were with us from the beginning of the show, we uh, started with, uh, with a trio of guests and quickly realized that uh, we wanted to go deeper. So it, the trio became a duo and now uh, we have um, a, a featured, uh, a, featured um, uh, a guest and a featured artist. And I think you'll see why we're so excited to have him uh, in just a, a moment. Please uh, give us your comments in the crawl. Uh, Gregarious, uh, our erstwhile producer, is backstage uh, juggling and uh, making the hamster cages revolve rapidly to make sure everything uh, functions uh, properly. Um, we are in the midst of curating all of the shows to date and uh, uh, posting them as individual interview clips uh, and also posting uh, written materials to accompany each uh, um, uh, episode. So uh, feel free to check intersectionslive.com uh, as that work uh, continues because we view our, our, our uh, segments as being evergreen, not just this week's uh, uh, conversation shortly to be consigned to the dustbin of history, but really um, evergreen material that can be viewed uh, for a long, long time to come because the themes we're dealing with are quite um, uh, long-term ones. So with that, uh, let me uh, turn my attention to laud and embarrass uh, our uh, our featured guest, Taylor Eigesty. Um 
I've known Taylor uh, for, I would say, almost at this point, maybe 20 years, uh, close to 20 years anyway. We'll have to talk about uh, the history of it when when he, he shows up. But he's a, a Bay Area a native, uh, uh, grew up in Menlo Park, California, and at the age of four, uh, uh, had this fateful encounter with the piano, and it was quickly obvious that he was a protege. Uh, whose career in music was supported by luminary, luminaries like Dave Brubeck and uh, Dave Benoit. Um, he's been a, uh, he's had his own albums, uh, seven to date, and I'm not sure if the one we'll talk about is number eight. So again, we've got a little bit of uh, administration to uh, cover in terms of the, the numerical stuff, but it's also appeared in over 50 albums as a sideman. He's He's got the Taylor Agusti Trio, he's got the Taylor Agusti Quartet, but he's also uh, uh, collaborated with everyone under the sun, performed in every imaginable venue from Carnegie Hall to Royal uh, uh, Festival uh, Hall in London, uh, participated in every imaginable jazz festival from Montreal to Singapore to Istanbul to Chicago to Newport to Sydney. Uh, has been on television, has been on tour with uh, 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 other luminaries like uh, Chris Botti, but also, you know, has a very interesting approach to jazz. I mean, I, I have a little bit of inside information because in my own um, very pediatric uh, uh, um, uh, efforts to uh, acquire some facility in jazz, Taylor and I, uh, who, in addition to being friends, had, uh, I got some real insight into his uh, creativity and into the fact that He's really, I believe, at the forefront of reinventing uh, jazz and um, uh, expanding the parameters of what jazz needs uh, to be in um, January of 2021. So without further ado, Greg, let's bring, uh, ta oh, Taylor is up already. I, I see him in full uh, Technicolor here. And also, uh, obviously, a master of the uh, streaming medium, which is a great asset to us. So Taylor, welcome to Intersections. Hey, John. It's uh, it's good to be with you. And uh, I'm trying to think of it. it has been 20 years. I'm turning 37 in a couple of months. So maybe probably approaching 20 years at least. Uh, I've known you a long time. Met you um, at I believe I met you the first time at Stanford Jazz Workshop. Right. And, um, and I've been teaching there for the last uh, shoot. I've been a part of Stanford Jazz since um, for about 25 years. and. Um, and I never skipped a year. Last year was the first year that uh, it had to go virtual, um, of course, which everything did. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's a that's a special place to me, and and uh, and not the not the least of reasons that uh, be being that uh, that's where I met you there. And um, man, I, I yeah, we've we've done um, a lot of uh, sharing of ideas over the years, and and. For the audience listening, John is one of the only people that I could have a five-hour conversation with <laughs> and not even realize that it's five hours. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Excellent, excellent. Well, this is yet. We'll add this is yet another modality to our ongoing jam session. So, I'm I'm curious, first of all, to uh, to know uh, how you fared during the pandemic because obviously a bunch of things got put on hold, live performance. Um, you had uh, and let me first applaud you a bit. So your uh, your long awaited uh, can I still use the term album? Uh, Tree falls, please. Uh, please yeah. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> the album Tree Falls. Uh, maybe I'm dating myself. The uh, album Tree Falls has just come out uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, if I yeah. remember correctly. But it was slated to come out uh, before the pandemic, and so that was on hold. Live performance was on hold. Uh, how was the pandemic for you? as a as a as a working artist uh it sucked um <laughs> there's just a that was for a sound bite that you can grab later for a little clip um mm -hmm. uh, but i stand by that it it uh you know i'm someone that likes to look at um and and very much inspired by people like you and and people who innovate and think uh, creatively i'm always drawn to trying to look at you know how to create when something bad or something unexpected happens trying to look at how to best use that uh 
as you know treat it as the best possible thing that could have happened and then you know come up with some creative ideas as to how to get through it but with the pandemic it's a little harder to do that um and and uh also you know just the number of people that we lost during that span of time it's um i I've had some people, I've had some conversations with people. I don't like to really debate people, but um, when people bring up opinions like, you know, there's all these really great things about, you know, the fact of the pandemic. And I'm like, nah, it's just not, it doesn't, um, you know, there's there's so many mental illnesses and things that were um, driven by this and people who, um, I know for me as a as a touring musician, I went from being on the road about 270 days out of the year to sitting at home, you know, and, and, um, and trying to adjust to that. And that was very hard for me. Um, and hard for all musicians and, and people who relied on getting on planes for a living. Um, cause that was, uh, I remember thinking in 2019, 2019, um, for example, was I had seven different trips to Japan, I think about five, six different tours out to Europe and, just constantly, you know, every day or every other day, just getting on a plane, going someplace, going to sound check, doing a show. And, you know, it became a routine where I remember even thinking like, God, I need a, I need a little break or whatever, but that is, this is not what I had in mind. So, um, you know, I, I, I think for me, um, I've always been someone that, uh, I've never, I've never um, shared enough content online and that sort of a thing because um, I've never had the time to do it. And I also just it was never really my um, thing. It was never really the type of thing that I love to do. What what I love to do the most is is perform, be out in front of people and and, um, you know, trying to play each concert like it's your last. I'm glad that that's always been my mentality because, you know, during that long period of time where I missed it, I'm glad. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad that I, I can at least say that I've I, I've given I, I gave all that I could in, in every situation, you know, and and um, but uh, but I had to learn a lot of new skills, um, you know, yeah, all what, were some, what, what, what were some of those new skills? Because you really, in a way, went as jazz music, musicians would say, went back to the woodshed to kind of discover how to stay um, not only relevant to the audience, but to stay, you know, artistically true to you and uh, given no concert venues, no traveling, et cetera. What did, what did you figure out for yourself? Right. Well, um, you know, you and I had different conversations at, at all sorts of different stages of the process, actually. And I remember talking to you when I was, you know, I, I was just learning what zoom was and, and, uh, and hated it. And, you know, it just, and some of the different things where I just wasn't, um, I had to learn how to you know, set up cameras and mic my piano at home and tune my piano, which was torture. And and a lot of these different things that, um, you know, if if you wanted to be able to present music for people at all, um, you had to adapt, you know, and it was it was a really it was a rough transition for me. Eventually, I figured a lot of the things out. It just took a long time. The learning curve's pretty steep with with a lot of those things, because there's you know, there's people that dedicate their entire lives to recording and filming and and um lighting and whatever else and and uh to to all of a sudden have to kind of become a um a jack of all trades in a way to pull that off um you know there's only so there's only so good that you can get at each of those different skills when they aren't your main thing so um for me it took a long time to adapt to things but then um you know one of the probably the biggest uh change for me was my entire life i've um told people no when, and when it came to online lessons um it just wasn't mm -hmm. something that i wanted to do I, i'm uh as you know from from when when we were doing lessons you know um i'm a little bit of a sustain pedal nut and i like to get down there and stare at it and you know just there's different body language when someone comes into a room and and if they if they have their left foot pressed down on the soft pedal the whole time i know that they're really nervous you know things like that that um i, I never knew that you could really kind of get as much out of um, online lessons as I discovered that is possible. One big benefit to that was after I figured out how to um, uh, how to I, I have a different setup now than I did certainly at the beginning of the pandemic. It was a little bit more, you know, trying to make it work. Um, I live in New York City and um, and I've since moved uh, places and I have a little bit more room. So, uh, you know, different students that I that I have, they asked for, you know, overhead cams and 
and all sorts <laughs> of fancy things like that so that they could um, have a better view of what's going on. Because, you know, it's one of those things to work out when you're trying to um, do something online as opposed to in person. And um, but I opened it up to say I'm willing to you know, teach different master classes and lessons online now. And, um, and the cool part about that is, um, there's been several, several days. I mean, I still only do it usually just a handful of days of the month. And, uh, but there's been several days where I've had like a student in, um, Japan, New Zealand, Hawaii, Vancouver, Berlin, maybe all in the same day, you know, things like that. So, um, that's been really cool to, um, kind of, get to know some people that I wouldn't have known otherwise that live in all sorts of different countries and all of that, that we can kind of connect in this way. Um, and it's still possible with, with, you know, along with myself getting better at miking and getting to know how to do all of that stuff, my, my students did too. So, mm -hmm. um, it's easier to hear them, uh, now than certainly back in April of 2020. But, um, but I've always been someone that while I enjoy teaching, it's just not my, um, uh, and, and I get really into it when I'm doing it. It's just not my biggest passion in life. And so when the thing that you're really, really, you know, the thing that you feel like you're good at gets taken away from you for such a long time, it was, um, that was a hard thing to, it was a hard thing to process. Also, I recorded that album, uh, before all of that began. And as you mentioned, it was my eighth album, Tree Falls. It was supposed to come out, uh, right before all this stuff. So I had to kind of, it was just that extra waiting and, and the uncertainty paired with like, you know, hey, I got this record that I'm re ready to release and, and all of that. But we finally um, I'm releasing with uh, GSI records and and they finally released it a, a couple of weeks ago. And um, and it's exciting to to be back in the swing of things of, of you know, having it's been 11 years since I released uh, my last album. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and I never want to take that much time again. Uh, but that long gap was largely due to the fact that I was um, always on tour uh, with a lot of different groups and um you know you need that perfect I intersection of of um creative motivation time and energy and you know resources and all that kind of stuff to be able to put a put together a, an album and also i was doing so many different types of projects that i didn't really necessarily know what i wanted to um mm -hmm best exemplify where my musical taste was. So uh, if it was going to be a solo piano album, which I threatened to do many times and told different audiences that I had a solo album coming out, but then um, was just never happy with that. It didn't feel like myself. And um, over the last decade, I've done a lot of different shows with symphony orchestra with my own music and my band with symphony orchestra and and playing with symphonies with Chris Bode and and a lot of other musicians and um, and I love that context dearly. So I didn't know if I wanted to do a fully symphonic record and and so when it came down to it, I just decided I wanted to I wanted to make a record. If I was going to take that much time between projects, I wanted to make um, an album that that reflected the music that I love the most of my own that um, that I you know, didn't share. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of undershare in a lot of ways. And, um, and there's a lot of music that I've written. I mean, enough music that you could sit there and click play and it would play for a couple of years <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, that no one's heard, you know, and, and it would be things that I would do that, that, um, uh, so the album being called Tree Falls, uh, the concept behind that album is is to kind of celebrate the creativity that happens when no one's around to listen to it. And um, and I oh, wanted okay. So it's the uh, it's the old saying of if uh, tree falls in the forest. Uh, uh, well, wh what what is the saying? Why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about the the concept behind the title and about the uh, the album itself? Yeah. Well, first of all, I love the term album. This is my first time having to also release singles uh because if you wait 11 years to release an album then the entire music industry changes and um everyone has to release things in singles i'm 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 personally uh i've never bought a single before i don't i i'm an album guy and um and i guess i'm kind of old school you know there's different people that grew up with a certain generation of things some people grew up with like a record player or tapes and i kind of was the generation of tapes cds and and um the iPods where you had the spinning wheel thing and all of that, that was kind of my generation and what I grew up on, but I would listen to albums. I grew up on, that's how I absorbed the music and, and mm -hmm. learned a lot about um, the legacy of, uh, of the type of music that I play and all of its branches and, and things like that. So, um, 
So singles are really weird to me. That's just my tangent of the fact that I love the term album because that's, you know, the other thing is an album tells a story. I spent so many different, um, just countless hours trying out different, maybe 500 different sequences of the record as to how I wanted the story to unfold. And then when you release singles, it kind of resequences the record. So, um, so I'm really particularly excited that people can actually finally hear the full album now. And the really gratifying thing to me is that a lot of people who have heard the album, um, they're reaching out to me in different messages and all of that saying that they, they get kind of the story that happens within this record. And, and that's really important to me. I wanted people to, um, I wanted to unravel it in, um, in a world where we get everything on demand at any time. I wanted people to hear it in that order. Uh, that was really important to me. So, um, but the, the term, if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? It's kind of an old saying. And um, which, you know, that's way too long of an album title. Um, but uh, and and as <laughs> as I got into it too, uh, originally it was going to be called "Tree Falls in a Forest," but then I uh, re realized that my last um, uh, <laughs> I've I've released too many records with five word titles, so I just <laughs> I, I thought it was nice and nice and short with just "Tree Falls" um, and uh, and and that's that's the and it's a my, the first album that I've ever put out that has pretty much all just my original music. Um, except for one um, arrangement of the standard Skylark that's very different. Um, and I wanted it to be a, a combination of the different projects that I was doing and the sounds that I love the most. So um, uh, it features uh, vocal uh, vocals on about 45% of the record, um, maybe 40%. Um, I've, I, I've, one of my greatest joys in life has been working with some, some of the best vocalists in the world. Um, Currently, I've been doing a lot with uh, Lisa Fisher uh, from the Rolling Stones and Luther Vandross and all that. And she's she's just unbelievable. Um, but I've, I've worked over the years with um, people like Gretchen Parlato and Becca Stevens. And I wanted them to be on this record because they're very much a part of my um, musical um, world. And we kind of we're all very good friends and and I love Casey Abrams as well. He's um he was a finalist on American Idol and I had been a fan of his for a while and we had connected somewhat recently and um and played together and just I really just hit it off and had a great vibe so um I asked him to be a part of it and so I had those three vocalists but then with um a rhythm section of uh some of my favorite musicians ever um Eric Harlan, Charles Altura, uh DJ Ginyard I met DJ Ginyard playing in Terrence Blanchard's band and Charles I've known since I was 10 or 11 years old mm. and um, who also plays in Terrence's band. And so um, that formed the rhythm section. And I, I wanted to then simulate some of those orchestral elements, too. So there's a small woodwind orchestra and string orchestra on this record that are layered. Uh, they're comprised of um, Sam Sadagursky, Ben Wendell, who also plays sax on, on the record. And then um, the strings were a layered, we really kind of layered a small symphony orchestra together uh, with three people, Nathan Schramm, Emily Ann Gentron, and uh, Hamilton Berry. And um, Nate Schramm did a lot of the um, the different, helped expand a lot of the string arrangements and things like that. So it was a pretty ambitious project with all of those different elements. But um, GSI is a, a great great studio in Manhattan, which you've been to, and, and they yeah. um, have their own label right now. And, and, um, and they really were a unique opportunity for me to actually make the record that I, the, the, the specific record that I wanted to make, which I don't necessarily think I would have gotten that opportunity in, in other contexts, you know? So, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's interesting as you describe the, um, uh, that first of all, the network of relationships, which I think has very much been a part of your journey is these close, knit, um, this close knit community that you've been able to surround yourself with, but also, you know, listening to what you're saying, it, this is not the central casting image of, you know, four hip people in suits and skinny ties, uh, you know, the classic, uh, piano, bass, drums, uh, trumpet, uh, playing, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the classical canon. So it's, to, to what extent do you feel like you're, you know, expanding the definition of jazz or or um, move, moving jazz forward, you know, by 
bringing in these different um, combinations of uh, performers and these orchestral textures, and and also you know having had a um, uh, an opportunity to sneak peek some of the uh, uh, the, the material on on Tree Falls, um, it it has a newness to it uh, that you know it seems to kind of expand the jazz idiom if if I uh, can call it that. I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Well, and yeah. How does that relate to your, you know, your kind of your mission? Sure. Well, um, for for me, I've always just enjoyed uh, with uh, one of the biggest things that I've enjoyed in in my musical life is variety, um, and I've been really lucky to have that. I grew up um, playing. Um, uh, really, it's been it's been a varied journey. I mean, what what got me interested in playing music was was uh, when I was a kid was listening to smooth jazz. So. Um, the Rippingtons and um, or people that were um, a part of that world. David Benoit was a real hero of mine growing up. And and um, um, one of my biggest idols and influences, kind of the reason why I wanted to be a musician. I asked my dad when I was eight years old, um, how much does David have to pay each time he performs? And he's like, no, he didn't get <laughs> paid to do that. So I um, I. <laughs> I, I figured, well, there you go. I'm I'm a musician, and and um and so I've always just kind of gone to, um. I I always wanted to just play what I like, you know. And sometimes putting a label on it can be, um, it can have its benefits because it can be easier to market something or promote it when it when there is an easy way to describe what you do to an Uber driver, um. But at the same time, um. I kind of I'm inspired by so many different types of music and always have been over the years that I've just kind of treated it as music. Like I've never really thought of the genre and stuff. And and um, and certainly growing up, I've spent just countless, countless hours like studying and learning and knowing the history of where this music comes from. And um, and it's all black American music. You know, it's it's all uh, different branches of that, you know, really. Um, Every single type of music I can think of um, is is uh, inspired by that and is a branch of that. And so um, things that are sound more like kind of traditional jazz music and things like that. You know, I've played many of those gigs and played uh, a lot of that music myself. And I love that. But I also love things in um, the rock world and the R&B world and the classical world and things like that. And so when I'm especially when it's my music, which this album um largely is uh and i'm not just doing standards or covers of other music and stuff when it's when it's personal then um it turns into a sound that i have a harder time necessarily describing or defining because it's an assimilation of so many other different things and so um i you know while that has its disadvantages in being able to i think some people look to comparison as their first entryway to enjoying something sometimes mm -hmm. and so um uh, to me, I kind of I'm most happy when people um, are hearing something that's fresh and original and um, and then later they can start comparing it or, or doing that sort of a thing. But um, but, you know, a lot of this music on this record was also created in this this bubble of just m my own working on things myself and, you know, just assimilating different influences that I like and 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 all of that. And um, but not trying to make it a part of any kind of trend or any other thing going on and stuff. I kind of, I kept it pretty insulated and stuff. And so I think when I have released this record now, you know, hopefully people can hear something that's a little bit different, you know, than um, you might hear in other contexts. And, um, and I, I, I like the genre -less, um definition. It's the same thing I feel when I do my music with symphony orchestras. Um, it's hard to define, like, you know, you can't necessarily put this in some sort of, um duke ellington tribute show or something you know it's right, it, right, it's not right. gonna, it's not gonna fit in in those kind of situations it's it's um you know but I, but i i i would hope and i think in the innovation world you just have to trust sometimes that if you're doing something that is a bit different um that eventually it takes on its own identity um when you trust in it enough to um put it out there you know and um you know I wonder, is there is there any way we could hear just a, a, a snippet from uh, the new album? I, you know, I think everyone's out there thinking, God, this sounds so interesting, but there's no way uh, for, is, is there no way for us to hear it? Um, 
I mean, well, I, I don't know well, that you want to spin a whole a whole track, but just you know, give us a little slice of what uh, the experience. Yeah. I, I could play a little bit of one of the songs. I, I don't want you to get flagged on YouTube or whatever. I don't know how those things <laughs> how those things work, but I'm I'm sure I could play a little snippet. Um, there's there's um, there's a as I mentioned, there's a variety on this, so a lot of different. Every track is very different. Um, but uh, for anyone who wants to listen to the full record, uh, just um, it's available on iTunes or Spotify, any of the streaming services, Apple Music. All it's available everywhere, and CDs and vinyls are coming in a in a month. So they wanted to do a digital release first. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll play a song that um, I wrote called Sparky. I'll just play the first couple of minutes, um, and that'll cool. give you kind of a little taste of of some of the new music. <laughs> Like yeah, that covers a lot of territory in in that uh, couple of minutes, uh, um, and really uh, swings in a very unusual way. You well, know, thanks. That I mean, it, it's it's cool that um, we we definitely had to kind of uh, build this record vertically in a lot of different ways, and so that was um, that was a cool it was a cool thing. And every 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 track on this is very it's very different. So it was just fun to. Um, definitely the most personal record that I've done because um, a lot of these tunes too it's also the first opportunity to have my own my own lyrics on um, mm -hmm. an album and and uh, although um, I'm not singing I leave that to the really good vocalist the but, experts, um, right yeah <laughs> but um, yeah it was a chance to get more personal and tell kind of more of a story about um, my family and my life and different things like that so mm -hmm. um, yeah I'm, I'm just yeah, I'm excited that it's out, and hopefully, people. Um, uh, hopefully, it's something that people will enjoy, or or yeah, or grow. I'm, to well, I'm sure they will. I mean, I I, I can imagine that uh, sales are spiking as we speak um, from <laughs> uh, exposing them to uh, Sparky. So um, that that is a good uh, transition to uh, what you're working on now. And one thing that you and I had the chance to talk about in some uh, depth was. A project that I guess has uh, goes now under the name of uh, imagining the future, which you know it, it seems like your um, approach is is really kind of uh, 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 assembling ingredients in an incredible range of formats, and then somehow embracing and curating and integrating them into a, a work of art. So 
I, from what I understand, uh, uh, imagining the future uh, is unfolding over time and space and involves a lot of different kinds of uh, participants, including students and web-based stuff and uh, live and asynchronous and so forth. Tell, so tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. I understand that you're now in the throes of you know, getting it all kind of cooked so it's ready for... Uh, um, I don't even know what to call it. Is it a release? Is it a performance? Is it a happening? Uh, but whatever it is, it's happening in November. So what? What is it? <laughs> yeah, we're we're still settling on a um a date for the premiere and and all of that. Um, but uh, I I will say also these these days it's I'm working on um I'm uh ooh now I'm getting an echo. Uh, let me just okay we can't hear anything. Us. Oh okay cool yeah. um. Well, these days I'm I'm uh, I'm doing a lot of touring with Lisa Fisher, which is it, which is crazy because we we're finally doing shows again for live audiences, um, mm -hmm. and I love that more than anything. And so we've done 14 shows in the last two weeks, I think. And um, so it's uh, it's it's everything right now is a, a little bit of a juggling act that uh, you know places started opening up all of a sudden, and then all of those gigs that got postponed three or four times, it's like, okay, now you got to do them. And now there's a real audience and that sort of thing. So I am working on um, this project in the midst of being back on the road, which is which is um, uh, super exciting and i'm I'm really, really happy to to have that balance. it's it's i'm I'm stressed in in the way that I enjoy right now. Um, so that's that's a good thing. And um, but uh, so the project that I'm working on that you were mentioning, it's called Imagine Our Future. And it's a, a collaboration between um, the Community School of Music and Arts in the Bay Area and um, and also the Hewlett Foundation. It was a commission through uh, Hewlett 50 Arts Commissions. And um, and what the project is, is I wanted to essentially crowdsource a composition um, from a snapshot of maybe a you know, hundred young people in the Bay Area. And um, the idea with this project would be um, kind of originates from um, when I'm composing, uh, there's, a, there's so many different angles that you can take and ways to compose and, and create something. And um, I used to do this uh, and still do actually, I'm doing it in, in, a, in a week. Um, uh, I do this master class called speed composition and where I take suggestions from the audience or from the students or, or whatever. Um, and I'm, I usually will be like, okay, give me, I, 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 I take about four or five Red Bulls usually before this. Um, but I say like, here, give me, give me four, uh, five or six notes. Okay, cool. Now give me eight different chords. Give me a time signature. Give me a, an emotion. Give me a sent uh, two sentences. And if you're doing this master class for, bunch of kids, you get some really wacky sentences. Um, and I try to take all of those things and in about 45 minutes, create like a full tune that's comprised of those elements. Um, because sometimes, um, you know, to get yourself composing, you know, it, it, you need a time constraint and you need um, some, some windows of limitation where, you know, if you have suggestions, you know, you have to like just work with those. And um, in that masterclass, I tend to, um, I kind of play around with the notes that I'm given, with the chords that I'm given, and I use uh, the sentence to create the phrasing of a melody, um, kind of creating some lyrics to the song, uh, and then ditching the lyrics and <laughs> just creating, a, having the song be there. Um, but so, you know, I kind of the genesis of that going backwards was, I would watch a lot of some of my favorite um, things are improv comedy, um, going to see that live or or I, I, I grew up as a kid watching Whose Line Is It Anyway or things like that. And when an audience gives you suggestions in a scene, like they're really rooting for you. They want their idea to work out, you know. And so uh, it was a way of kind of my first entry into incorporating the idea of just taking suggestions from outside sources and turning that into the uh, components and and kind of building blocks of a composition. And so the larger scale version of this is, um, and a lot of it comes from conversation that I had with you where we were kind of brainstorming a lot of different mm -hmm. um, ideas of how to go about this. And um, the, the core idea behind this is that if you took a snapshot of about 100 kids in, in one area, um, kids being defined as like 17 or or under um 
there's I think there's an 18 year old or two that snuck into the mix. Um, but in just one region, you know, the Bay Area, and you ask them to all respond to the same prompt, which is just imagine our future. And people could submit ideas that were musical ideas, uh, visual, photography, uh, um, artwork, um, words, poetry, um, uh, choreography in certain, certain cases. Um, but anything that allowed them to respond to that prompt in a creative way. Um, what I'm trying to do is take all of those about 100 ideas and, and use all of them to weave them together into one hour long large ensemble um, composition presentation. It's going to be it's it's a little bit maybe the most ambitious thing that I've embarked on in the sense of um, the actual performance of it is going to involve um, kind of doing the, a live soundtrack to a movie that's going to feature a lot of the artwork of of different people. And um, but the cool thing with this is I get to play I get to play God and, um, you know, essentially uh, I, I can use just the smallest piece of someone's idea, or I could use the whole thing, you know, so having the flexibility to use maybe, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a six year old that uh, drew an artwork and, and a piece of artwork that was, um, well, it was very much a six year old's uh, painting. And, um, but then her description of it, was incredible. Um, she, the first part of it was, you know, the Big Bang. Well, I'm imagining another one, and this one is a little smaller, so it doesn't destroy humankind. Um, uh, you, you know, kings and queens, they'd be back in their castles like olden days. Like she basically wrote this unbelievable mm -hmm. description that then I turned those into lyrics of a mm -hmm. tune that uh, that starts the whole the whole um, concert is going to start with this song called "You Know the Big Bang." And um, the bass line to that tune comes from the viola part in a viola and cello duet that another kid submitted that um, that was just her, you know, her response to Imagine Our Future. So there's all these different elements that I'm now taking and putting in different songs. And some of them I'm, I'm literal, I'm being very literal. Like, so some of the artwork is just going to be projected or incorporated into the, um, the movie part of it. And then there's other things that might be uh, uh, kind of cross across the synesthetic spectrum or chromesthetic spectrum. So for me, I have um, not to go on too much of a tangent of that because that's a whole thing. But, um, I, you know, I have that type of synesthesia where I, I kind of get a vague impression of different colors when I see mm -hmm. um, different uh, when I hear different music or or see different notes or that sort of a thing. So sometimes certain uh, artwork, I'm trying to use some of the colors of that to um, uh, feed back into the musical world. And, and um, so some of their ideas I'm trying to use in a surprising way. The goal behind all of this being to um, emphasize to a cross section of young people that it's important to um, create and you never know how your idea is going to end up. You know, if you're if you're putting something out into the world and you're creating something, you you have no control over it. You don't know if the the smallest corner of some idea that you have could turn into something huge. Um, and you don't know if the thing that you work the hardest on and spent the most time on is the thing that won't be used that much, you know? So it's a real combination of all that. And, um, and I'm in a, uh, um, in the studio room right now, um, a couple of my walls look like I'm trying to solve a serial murder case because um, <laughs> there's, it's just covered. I've covered my walls with different lines pointing to different things. Cause what I really had to do was um, in order to put it all together, you know, it's 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 um, I'm experienced enough at the idea of taking a bunch of ideas and turning them into a musical thing. So I've been doing that for a while. But um, but what I needed to do in order to create a, a real presentation is is tell a story, you know, create a reason why all of these ideas are coming together. And so for me, the um, I, after after working on kind of um, uh, putting together um, one area of my wall just lists different themes. And it's amazing to see actually how aligned a lot of these young people are. So different themes like um, uh, taking care of the environment, um, being socially active and, and uh, pro-women, pro-LGBT, pro-equality um, um, and, and all of this. But then there's also themes of worry and uncertainty and despair and self-doubt and things like that. So basically, 
all of these different ideas, they're all such beautiful submissions and ideas. Um, it's not a contest of merit. So I'm not like taking ideas and be like, I like that, that idea the best. And I'm right. going to, that, you know, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to basically, um, have a combination of everything. And some ideas I, I am just using just a few notes, um, or just a corner of it. And some ideas I'm using an entire, um, there's, uh, one one uh, young vocalist, composer, singer songwriter. She's sixteen. She's probably eighteen now. Because <laughs> by the when I first got these yeah, submissions right. was in two thousand eighteen. Um, uh, but uh, I'm going to use her whole tune because I really I just there's something about that tune that feels like a centerpiece with all this. So first I divided everything up into themes and um, and then tried to start just getting different fragments of song ideas from different things. Some of the people who submitted some musical things. Um, I grabbed certain parts of their tunes and turned that into something. And so I had kind of like the kernels of that. Then I have a rough time frame of there's going to be an hour presentation, an hour long concert. And um, but then I, I had to, um, after dividing things into themes, then think of just what story ties all this together? What what reason do we have to um, be looking at all of these yeah, ideas? Why together? do we care? Right. And so for me, I kind of came I came up with um, since the whole thing is turning into being pretty cinematic. I mean, it's going to be a cool performance with a lot of uh, crazy lighting and a little bit of choreography and and um, and there'll be a projected movie the whole time and, and all of that with different um, artwork appearing literally and uh, that that pertains to certain things in the in the in the uh, pieces. Um, but I kind of came up with the storyline that makes sense of a time traveler uh, in the year 2323, um, uh, two days or two or three days before the end of the world, um, is sent back in time to the year um, uh, 2019, <laughs> I guess, which is like when, when a lot of this stuff started to um, come together, or 2018, which is when these ideas were submitted. And uh, to listen to the ideas of young people, because that's what led to the, to, to the destruction of the world in 2323. The Council of Elders sent someone back to finally, like, they realized their gravest mistake was they didn't listen to young people. Mm -hmm. And so um, this time traveler is speaking with people in the ancient land of Northern California and, um, and trying to gather their ideas as to the future. Because um, I truly believe... Um, and and certainly these submissions are, have been an example of that, that um, listening to a younger generation and taking them seriously is a lot of times the answer. Um, and a lot of times uh, really, you know, they're going to be the ones shaping the building blocks of the future anyways. And so it's important to listen to them. And um, I mean, some of these kids were incredibly prophetic. I've mentioned to you before that that um, uh, some of some kids who submitted photographs in 2018, uh, just responding to the prompt, imagine our future. Like one kid uh, sent in a picture of him wearing a mask. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, several kids. There was one that drew himself wearing a mask. And and people saw all of the different concerns and things that are so relevant now um, that uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, that a lot of times some of these kids kind of saw some of this coming, like the um, you know, that we're going to deal with, they're prepared, you know, they're prepared for just about anything. And, um, and so I want the storyline and the different pieces and the music to kind of reflect that, to reflect the respect for a young generation of people that have ideas and, um, concerns that are important, you know, and, and it's important to listen to them. And, um, and in the process, uh, I'm going to have a, um, uh, Becca Stevens is going to be singing vocals on this show. Uh, Kendrick Scott is going to be playing drums with all sorts of electronic triggers, um, which might be synced up with different things in the visuals. Um, there's going to be uh, probably about 12, 13 people performing. Um, but I'm really excited to premiere it. I still, you know, I'm less than halfway through the full writing process, although maybe I'm Maybe one could say that I'm more than halfway through in the sense of the gigantic amount of work that I've done so far on this. Um, there's, you know, there's there's a lot more to come, but but I've already I've got it to the place where at least I have I have a set list, essentially. So yeah. I know the order that the show is going to go. I know the shape of the tunes. I could I'm, I basically kind of know um, each tune. There's there's about four tunes that are pretty much fully done. Um, and there's a few tunes that uh, um, 
when I'm composing anything, you kind of get an idea in your head where you, you don't know what it's going to sound like. I felt like this before making this new album, you know, uh, where I'm like, I get the f overall feeling of what this album is going to be and what this is going to feel like. And but I don't know the specifics of what this is going to look like or sound like and all that. I can just trust that if you have the right people involved and, you know, you know, you trust in the direction that you're going, that'll end up being something cool. Mm -hmm. And um and so I'm at that point with this, like, I know that this is going to end up being really, really cool and really special. And um, the hardest thing for me composing wise is um, um, I can, since I can't sing, <laughs> um, it's hard for me to. One thing you can't do. Oh, it's well, you, you, you should. Yeah, you should see me try to play golf. Um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it it's it's something that. Uh, since I can't sing, it's hard sometimes because a lot of these tunes have lyrics that are based on something that one of these kids wrote. Um, and uh, and actually, the most recent piece of these that I've finished, um, I'm I'm really proud of this one. Actually, this this particular tune is called uh, "Am I Beautiful Yet," and it's based on uh, the descriptions. There was a, a young girl that submitted a photograph of her looking in the mirror, and mm -hmm. um, and she was. Uh, her description was talking about how she's there's so many worries and self-doubt and stigma and being able to fit in and live up to a beauty standard and that sort of a thing. So I kind of dissected some of the words in her description and turned those into lyrics. Um, for each tune, I have kind of a separate folder that I work on. Um, once I've divided them into these tunes, then I'm like, OK, here's all the ideas that fit in this tune all of that. And then I do what I've been calling a lyric storm. So I just kind of sit down and I look at all the des descriptions or words, or in some cases, poetry, some people submitted. Um, and I try to just kind of free, uh, free associate freely put down different words and terms and just keep it kind of free form. Um, and then once I have a page of different words and, and diction and terminology and all that kind of stuff, then I'm, then I kind of start to back engineer that and, um, you know, go about that process of building a tune where, you know, which of these words or phrases fit different places and all that. So that's what I kind of did to deconstruct, um, that tune. Am I beautiful yet? But I really love that tune. I really felt um, I know that if I'm at the point where if a tune that I wrote, if it gives me chills, then I'm like, yes, you know, like, I think this is then then I can stop overthinking it, you know, and trying to keep rewriting it and rewriting it, because I, I truly believe, you know, there has to be a point where something is finished enough to be done, because but you could always keep uh changing and tweaking something you know if you if you finish a a, a, a presentation or a project of some kind um and your first thought is let me ask someone else what they think of this uh that person it could be perfect but that person is going to come up with things that you should change and then if you do it again and you do it again and you do it again then it's never ending then you're just you know you're you're just asking for more people to change you know it's 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 like you know anything um if someone is asked to share an opinion, like if you ask them, what would you change about this? People will find something, you know, because everyone's different. So um, so I truly believe in also the process of trying to be accepting enough to your own creation to just say, this is done. This is this is cool now. And I'm at that point with that particular tune in this. And but I can't sing. And it's got these lyrics that I that I kind of based around that description and everything. And so I was at a sound check with Lisa Fisher in. Um, in Seattle, it's a real luxury to have um, one of the greatest Grammy winning singers of all time um, able to just, you know, I'm like, Lisa, could you sing this for a second? Like, and so hearing her voice sing this, um, I got chills again. And I'm like, OK, cool. I'm going the right direction with this tune, because hearing hearing a real vocalist actually sing something is so much better than when I'm in the room, like, nah! you know, trying to trying to. Um, you know, there's no way to simulate it. You know, there's no keyboard sound with vocals unless you get really cheesy. There's some real cheesy vocal sounds on some keyboards. But but that, you know, when you hear a, a sound that doesn't sound good, then it makes it so you, you, you start to overthink things. You start to say, well, it's, maybe that's a bad idea because it didn't sound good. It's like if you're writing an orchestra score in Sibelius or something like that, and the, the sounds that are built into that program suck. So when then when you play it, it's just like you're like, oh, man, I should change all this because it doesn't sound good. But there's actually some programs that um, 
uh, that directly affect playback. And, in, you know, they, they, they increase the quality of that so you can feel more confident as you go about composing. And but it does help. Well, that you know, I think the idea of chills as, you know, your kind of litmus paper is, uh, is a good one. And I think uh, I'm certainly getting chills just hearing the description of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the assembly that you've uh, um, put together of all of these different ingredients. I guess, you know, it's, it's amazing. We're, we're almost out of time and I feel like we've just started the interview, you know, uh, and we're 10 minutes into it, but we're almost at the bottom of the hour. So I want to, I want to end with one uh, question, which is um, um, how can people find out about the show? And given the fact that it, there are, um, you know, technology based elements to it, are there ever going to be ways for people to experience the show uh, asynchronously? And are you ever going to, uh, you know, think about taking this framework and expanding it? Because you've got a hundred kids in the Bay Area, but there are billions of kids around the world that all have a stake in the in the future. And it seems like you've put your finger on something really, really important. So, so real quick, you know, um, how do we uh, stay current and uh, know? Uh, how to how to how to connect with this incredible uh, work of uh, creative art, and then um, are you ever going to think about this as a platform for expanding it? Well, definitely. I think the the first goal for me is to get through this initial just this project itself, you know, which is going to be <laughs> yeah. it's because um, there's also going to be a like a, maybe a 20 minute documentary before that kind of shows some of the making process of it and all that kind of stuff. And so once I can. Um, kind of like in a composition itself, you know, once I can get to a certain stage of it, then I can um, consider other ideas or expansion of it and all of that. And um, uh, we're at this point, we're, we're trying to premiere this in late November, or it may be pushed to December. Um, this actually was supposed to be premiered in April of 2020. And, uh, uh, you know, but the pandemic, uh, and I, I, or I wouldn't say any silver linings of the pandemic, but it did technically <laughs> allow more time to um and also the other thing is i don't mind the fact that this has been pushed because some of these ideas that were submitted in 2018 you know god it's so interesting to watch their increased relevance as the world moves forward throughout sure. everything that's going on and, and certainly all of the tumultuous events of the last year beyond the pandemic and things and just uh, social justice racial equality like everything like that these themes are all in there and they all come from kids and they all came from kids that saw all this coming into uh, 2018 um but so the premiere will be in the bay area most likely the south bay so um there's a, a venue that we're looking at that um that we haven't fully uh, committed to a date yet, but November or December, if people go to my website, Taylor um, I'll have it updated with the most current information with that or, um, arts for all.org is CSMA's website arts, the number four, all.org. Um, and they'll have some information on the premiere when it, you know, but we're, we're, we're about a month away from really settling in on a, um, uh, a date for the venue and announcing when, um, but so people will see it in person and, um, I believe it might be a free concert too. I think by then too, you know, there's not going to be any, I know that all sorts of gigs now are, are happening where things are open again and there aren't as many, you know, space limitations or that sort of a thing. So hopefully by November we'll be at least in the clear of being able to put yeah, on a show. Like without a, um, yeah. So, um, fingers crossed there. Um, but, uh, people can see it in person and then also I'm going to get it, um, a really nice quality uh, video documentation of this because it's gonna, there's so many visual elements that go along with what's happening musically that um, I feel like it, this this project deserves it. And it's, um, it's kind of a part of that grant or a part of that commission too, where they want to, um, they want it to be preserved, you know, and they want this to be, I'm really thankful to Hewlett Arts, uh, to uh, the Hewlett Foundation for allowing this to, um, take place and allowing me the opportunity to to put this together um because i think that once this is then documented um it's a cool thing to consider this being a template for crowdsourcing other similar compositions from people in a different area of the world because you know a cross section of people in the bay area they're all very aligned i've found and if you took a cross section of people in um Algeria or Iceland or um, uh, New Zealand, you know, people will 
it, there's a different mentality. There's different things that they're going through at a, at any given time in the world, and and so it would be interesting to see um, all of those cross sections. And so this may end up serving as a template to do yeah. another uh, one or several more um, of these kind of performances that that would uh, be more geared towards people in a different area. But this is just it's just one cross section, and. Um, and I'd have to think of a whole new storyline too, like the time traveler. Something went wrong; it went back again. So, <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, you know, at when phase one is accomplished, uh, that there will be room for a br another brainstorm to think about how to turn this from being uh, um, uh, a, a not that it's local because the themes are universal, but um, uh, you know, there are sparks here to blow on to create a real uh, uh, a real global movement and. Um, Definitely. You know, I, I just want to also mention to anyone who might be listening, who is a composer or creator, all that, uh, don't give up on searching for a like a Eureka moment, because during this process, I got to say, and especially given that I've had to do a lot of this writing during the whole we're stuck at home part of humanity, you know, um, I'll go through five, six days in a row where I'm virtually going down to Walmart and picking up an application. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I shouldn't I shouldn't why I don't even know how to compose or anything. And then the next day I'll write something that will give me chills. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, cool. It's there. It's still there. You know? So sometimes there's, there's uh, I just wanted to mention that it's this, this project is, has retaught me the importance of trusting yourself and trusting the fact that you got to fight through some days of, of coming up blank when you're searching for ideas and just knowing that they're there. Well, you know, uh, uh, the, um, the value of being tested or a crisis or a pandemic or a total disruption uh, is uh, um, uh, the measure of your commitment. And, you know, I think one thing that has been obvious to me from the very first moment we met is how committed you are to your art and to expression and now committed really to the conversation between art and the, uh, the, the needs that a, uh, you know, a somewhat woebegone world has because if we can't harness the idealism and energy of young people, we we don't have much. Um, so with that, hey Taylor, thank you so much for being here. This is as usual was a you know mammoth treat to kind of go through your current work and how the year has been going, and we all look forward to uh, monitoring uh, your, your your and imagine helping you to imagine your future uh, in terms okay. of applauding you. Well, so thanks. thanks. Thank you. Okay. So with that, uh, let's see if Gregarious might be um, might be uh, there. He's there. So, uh, Greg, you want to take us out? I think I can do it too, but you are the pro.